Right then guys, here I am for the 25th episode in my Stewards Manager series on Grand Prix World. At the end of the previous episode, I said I had something interesting to talk about regarding the FI rankings, and that is, Stuart are currently second in the FI rankings. We stand to get 30 million dollars. Now that's actually fairly meaningless and a pipe dream because there is no way we're going to finish second in the FI rankings come the end of the season. Top 5 certainly, but second I really doubt. In fact we've actually been second in the FI rankings before, only once before, but after the second round last season we were briefly second in the FI rankings. And that's the thing, it's easy to be high up in the FI rankings early on in the season because if you have one retirement, that affects your average finishing position massively. Well let's take a look, Williams, decent team, top 5 team, no doubt about it, and they've had no retirements. Stewart, we're in second. Performance-wise, we're pretty much on a par with Williams. However, we've retired once this season. So, there you go, that costs us the position to Williams. Benetton and McLaren, both teams definitely quicker than Williams and Stewart. They're both race-winning teams. Well, actually, McLaren haven't won a race yet, but they're certainly capable of it. But both teams have retired twice each this season. Come the end of 2001, Benetton and McLaren having one more retirement than us will be fairly meaningless because they will have had the quantity of race wins and podium finishes to offset having one more retirement. But for now, having one more retirement is massively damaging. Well, let me put it this way. Benetton and McLaren have both retired twice as many times as Stewart. On to some more frustrating news, and that is... Well, despite the fact, since I've taken charge of Stuart, I've improved the team immensely. This season is our best one to date already. But whilst I've improved the team and improved the reputation of the team to the rest of the Formula 1 world, I haven't done so enough. Yes, I was able to convince Wurtz and Frentzen to join the team next year, and that's fantastic. Great driver lineup, no qualms there. But, well... The chief designers, that's always been a frustrating ordeal because I've tried on a number of occasions, on a number of different seasons, to convince Oatley or Byrne to join us, they just won't. And that's a constant struggle because we can't really move too much further up the grid without a better chassis. And Mike Gascoigne's good, but he's not amazing, that's the problem. Now of course we've got Harvey Postlefweight, loving his work, fantastic. And of course we've now got a four-star chief mechanic, Paul Diggins. I mean, to be honest, I did consider signing Eddie Irvine purely because Diggins has got a driver loyalty to him. And I don't know what that does. I don't know whether that gives a boost to the mechanic department or a boost to Eddie Irvine's on-track performances if I signed Eddie Irvine and kept on Paul Diggins. I don't know what would have happened. Potentially something good, but either way, I'm happy with the cheaper drivers of Frentzen and Wurtz. What's frustrating though is the commercial manager situation. Yes, I've got Stefano Domenicali this season and he has done wonders for the team, absolute wonders, but well, I made him an offer at the start of the season. He didn't accept it and before I had a chance to offer him a second contract, he joined Benetton and Ian Phillips joined Jordan, I believe, for next season. So that's the problem, is these top guys in Formula 1 I mean, we were lucky to sign Stefano Domenicali, but they either don't want to join us or they're willing to join us but only after we've spoken to them on a number of occasions. But that's the thing, these are the best guys in their respective fields in Formula 1. Everyone wants them and everyone's talking to them. And yes, yeah, sure, we're more highly regarded than, let's say, Minardi or Tyrrell, but, you know, when Domenicali's got the choice of sticking with us or going to Benetton, of course he's going to go with Benetton. That's the problem and, well, the commercial manager situation is bordering on desperate because we can't sign Ian Phillips or Domenicali. Now, every other three-star rated commercial manager has been signed. I mean, there's Kaiser who's two-star rated. But all the other three-star rated commercial managers have contracts for next season, except Yves Lambert, who's currently with Ferrari, and David Warren, who's with McLaren. 
Earlier on this season, I offered both Lambert and Warren contracts to join the team, but yeah sure they're only 3 star rated, but it is very difficult to convince anyone to leave Ferrari and McLaren, two prestigious teams, to join Stewart. I'm going to talk to them again though, because quite frankly, it's either sign one of those two, or always get someone who's 2 star rated at best. Now I am going to offer them a longer contract, now that's another thing is it's very difficult to convince anyone to sign a one season long deal, but the reason I did it was because Ian Phillips will be free in 2003, so that would have coincided nicely if I got either one of these guys on a one season long deal, so they would have been a stopgap before I signed Ian Phillips. Well, in an ideal world, of course, I would still need to convince him to join the team. And, of course, Domenico Carly, he isn't free until 2005, so it's either a one-season or a three-season-long deal. But I've almost given up hope on trying to get someone who's five-star rated, permanently anyway, so I'm just going to do a two-season-long deal and, of course, up the wage or the salary that I'm offering to pay Lambert. And he's accepted that, fantastic, although David Warren is cheaper. And I'll tell you what, I will actually offer Warren a one season long deal again, because I really do want someone for one season. Oh, that's brilliant! Previously he thought one season was too short. And he also thought Stuart was rubbish, but now he's willing to join us. Maybe he's realised there's so few teams left with commercial managers free for next season that, you know, Stuart, we're a decent team, he's willing to take a chance on us because most other top teams, I think, have got their commercial managers signed and sorted for next season. So, David Warren, three-star rated for one season, that is fantastic. And hopefully, hopefully, we can get five-star rated Ian Phillips the year after, but... As it stands, we've got 5-star rated Stefano Domenicali, then 3-star rated David Warren, and hopefully, after that, we can go back to someone who's 5-star rated. This is why I don't want Stefano Domenicali to go, because before he joined the team, we couldn't get a team sponsor to even talk to us. Yeah, sure, since then we've actually improved out on track, and on track performance certainly helps, but team sponsors didn't want to talk to us. We then get in Stefano Domenicali, and suddenly, not only do Red Bull want to sponsor us, we've completed the deal already. We haven't even done the fourth race of the season, and the deal's done. I'm going to sign it a two-season-long deal worth $22.5 million per year. Anyway, after all that talking, let's finally get into some racing with the 2001 San Marino Grand Prix. A fairly standard qualifying session by the looks of it. Michael Schumacher is on pole position, but let's not forget, he hasn't finished a single race so far this season, so starting on pole position is all well and good, but you actually need to finish a race. David Coulthard second, so he's in prime position to inherit the race win, should Michael Schumacher not finish yet again. Heinz Aldfrenson in third, Damon Hill in fourth, Giancarlo Fisichella in fifth. Then there's Pedro Diniz in sixth, one of our drivers starting in the points places. Now that's great news, Johnny Herbert in the Williams in 7th, we've beaten one Williams and actually Toro Takaki in 9th beat the other Williams of Esteban Tuero. And in the middle of all of this, Moreira qualified in 8th, so he was beaten by one Stewart and one Williams driver, but out qualified the lesser skilled driver at each team. It's funny how the running order for this season has played out, because in real life, ever since, certainly since 2018, quite possibly 2017 as well, people have hypothesised about the Drivers' Championship in real life Formula 1 if both Red Bull, Mercedes and Ferrari drivers didn't take part, because it would be incredibly close. I've heard people talk about this on Twitter, on Reddit, because... Well, this season, in Formula 1.5, as people call it, I imagine it would be a battle, a very closely contested battle between both Renault and McLaren drivers and possibly Kimi Raikkonen as well. In fact, quite probably Kimi Raikkonen, I dare say he might even be leading it. But generally speaking, if you go back through Formula 1's history, I mean, let's go back to, let's say, 2008. 
you know, it was Ferrari, McLaren and BMW Sauber who were quite a way ahead of everyone else. Or even back to the early 2000s. I mean, this is 2001, but this is a pretty weird 2001. But in the early 2000s, in real life Formula 1, you had Ferrari, McLaren and Williams, who were way ahead of everyone else. Of course, Renault eventually caught up and overtook everyone, but... Generally speaking, you get two or three teams who are miles faster than everyone else. This, though, is completely the other way around because it's actually quite small incremental gaps in qualifying times all the way down the order. Yeah, sure, there's a four-tenth gap between Rossette in the Minardi and Tuero in the Williams, and that's fairly big, especially in context of this game, but... It's fairly small incremental gaps, but then you get to the gap between 16th and 17th place. It's 2.4 seconds. Alexander Wurtz is the leader of the, I guess, Formula 1.5 battle. I mean, it's not really a battle, it's actually a bit of a joke. I know there's the reasons as to why Arrows and Prost and Sauber are so slow, but it's actually depressing. They shouldn't even be allowed to race. If Vert, the quickest of those drivers, is 2.4 seconds away from 16th place Mikasalo in a Tyrrell, you shouldn't be allowed to race. It's actually an abomination, to be honest. It makes the sport look pretty awful. I mean, Vert did well for Arrows, but his teammate, Jan Magnussen, 22nd place. Michael Schumacher's pole position time was in the 1 minute 25s. Jan Magnussen's qualifying time, yeah sure it's the slowest one on the grid, but it's not exactly that much slower than certainly Sarazan's time in the Sauber. Jan Magnussen's qualifying time was incredibly close to being in the 1 minute 30s. Schumacher was in the 125s, Magnussen, the slowest, was nearly in the 1 minute 30s. That's just... A crying, crying shame. Yet another podium for Tora Takaki. Now that I didn't expect. Tora Takaki for Stewart finished in third place. Johnny Herbert finished in second, which is slightly annoying because that means Williams have outscored us by two points. But surely the biggest surprise, and this really shouldn't have been a surprise, but Michael Schumacher won the 2001 San Marino Grand Prix. That's his first finish of the season, and by the looks of it, Fizzy Keller didn't finish. So that means, unless I'm mistaken, the two Ferrari teammates are now tied on points. Moreira finished in 4th, that's a turn up for the books, although not as much as Andrea Montemini in the Tyrrell, he finished in 5th, he beat Eddie Irvine in the Jordan. I mean there must have been a lot of big name retirements, Fizzy Keller for one, Pedro Diniz for another, but Andrea Montemini in the Tyrrell finished in 5th. There is no way that would happen without there being a lot of retirements, I mean look, Mikasalo and the other Tyrrell in 8th, both Jordans 6th and 7th, Minardi 9th and 10th. Now I know Minardi are quite a way ahead of Arrows and Pross and Sauber, but look, even Alexander Wurtz in the Arrows finished in 11th, then both Pross in 12th and 13th. We don't even have to scroll down to get to Prost. That's how many retirements there were. Both McLarens retired with an engine issue. Now that is bad, that is really bad, although there were actually quite a few engine retirements. Deniz also out with an engine issue, as was Frentzen and Zonta and Sarazan. This might be the unlikeliest drivers' championship standings possible. Frentzen leading isn't that much of a shock, but Johnny Herbert tied in second with Moreira. That's a turn up. Takaki in fourth. Takaki is ahead of both Ferrari drivers who are tied on points. David Coulthard in a McLaren down in 7th. Yes, sure, he's on 9 points, only 7 off of the top. It's actually very closely contested, certainly down to 7th at least. Damon Hill, 3 points less than his teammate. Pedro Diniz, joint 9th with Tuero, but he's got less than half the points of his teammate. The first two pages of post-race news are fairly standard, usual stuff, or stuff which I already know about. Although, I am glad the game reminded me that, of course, Andrea Montemini finishing 5th in the San Marino Grand Prix, scoring those two points, those are his first ever Formula 1 Championship points. 
Now that's all well and good. That's standard news. But look at this. Celso Moreira, he apparently expects to be leading the championship after the next few races. Okay, fair enough, he's done well so far this season, finishing fourth last time out, winning his home Grand Prix in Brazil, but what makes this particularly strange is that I've never seen another driver in this game come out to the world's press and say they reckon they're going to win the championship or lead the championship. Schumacher, Hakkinen, I mean we're talking really talented drivers who of course are in the running to win the championship. They at least have displayed modesty in the past. Moreira is one of the lowest rated drivers on the grid. I mean if everyone was in equal cars he would probably finish... I mean it's difficult to say because he has done well this season, not amazingly, not you know championship winning material, but he has been decent this season, but if everyone was in equal cars, he probably would finish 19th in the Drivers' Championship, at best 19th. And he's got the balls to come out to the world's media and say he reckons he's going to lead the championship. Ferrari have signed Olivier Panis, which would be a big story were it not for the fact that Panis is going to be their test driver. He has to be, that's the only seat available, which means Panis has spent years as Williams' test driver, and he's finally got another role, but it's another test driver role. I mean, it's incredibly sad that Panis, Panis is too good to be a test driver. He can't get a race seat, but Moreira can. To be fair, I'm pretty guilty because I've got two pay drivers of Takaki and Deniz, so... I'm not exactly combating the situation, but Panis is too good to be a test driver, simple as. Hang on, why have they written that? Stewart is playing it safe with the appointment of David Warren. How are we playing it safe? I don't get that at all. I mean, actually, David Warren was the best of those who were available. I don't understand how we're playing it safe. Anyway, the FIA have issued the regulations, the chassis regulations for next year, which is fantastic. So we can start working on next year's car. Now, Benetton, Benetton's cars sounded incredibly smooth at the last race. So that must be automatic gears. I'll get on to looking for that. Now, okay, Peter Sauber has been named the least effective manager in F1. And Jean Todd, unsurprisingly, the manager of the month. Yet another example of why I don't want Stefano Domenicali to go, because he negotiated all three bonuses with Red Bull in just one race. He upped their sponsorship amount from $22.5 million to $23.85 million. He did all of that in just one race and with just 25% of his staff. Stewart have already had one podium finish this episode, but let's see if we can make it two podium finishes in two races, and two podium finishes in a single episode. So, let's get into the 2001 Spanish Grand Prix. By the looks of it, it was a fairly standard qualifying session. Michael Schumacher's on pole position, Heinz Aldfrenz in second, David Coulthard in third. The entirety of the top six is populated by Ferrari, Benetton and McLaren, no surprises there. Toro Takaki qualified in seventh, with Pedro Diniz, his teammate, in ninth. Johnny Herbert and the Williams splits the two drivers. So Toro Takaki beating the Williams of Johnny Herbert, that is good news for the race. But what is more encouraging is that Toro Takaki did a 1 minute 20.8, Johnny Herbert a 1 minute 21.2. Long and short of it, Takaki's qualifying time was closer to Michael Schumacher's than it was to Johnny Herbert's. Mika Salo in a Tyrrell beat Esteban Tuero in a Williams, then you've got Ricardo Rosset, Eddie Irvine, and down at the bottom, you've got Montemini, Alessi, Collard, then Sarazan. Sarazan did a 1 minute 23.9. He was 2.2 seconds away from Emmanuel Collard. Or look at it another way. He was, and bearing in mind he qualified in 17th, so not at the bottom because Shinji Nakano was the slowest, with a 1 minute 
four. Shinji Nakano in 22nd place was almost exactly four seconds slower than Michael Schumacher. Even if you go back to Sarazan in 17th, he was still 3.4 seconds slower than Michael Schumacher. Those bottom three teams, Sauber, Prost and Arrows, I don't know why they bother competing because, well even Sarazan was 2.2 seconds away from Emmanuel Collard in a Minardi. If you're getting thrashed by Minardi, why even bother? Another podium finish. Toru Takaki finished in third place. Only 12 drivers finished the Grand Prix, but Michael Schumacher, he was one of them. Michael Schumacher has won the 2001 Spanish Grand Prix. That's his second race win in a row, off the back of three straight retirements. David Coulthard finished in second and only beat Toru Takaki by six seconds. Takaki in 3rd place, he beat Moreira in a Benetton by 24 seconds. Pedro Diniz finished in 5th, so Diniz, considerably slower than Takaki, that really is a turn up. Although Pedro Diniz, credit to him as well, yes, he was the slowest Stewart driver, but he beat on raw pace Damon Hill in a McLaren. Neither Williams driver scored points, and that's despite the fact both of them finished. Johnny Herbert in 7th, Esteban Tuero in 8th. Mika Salo finished in 9th, Gianna Lacy 10th, and Jano Trulli was the second to last finisher in 11th, and Jan Magnussen last and lapped twice. A total of 10 drivers retired from the race. Sarazan and Collard both had brakes failures, Eddie Irvine made a mistake, Alexander Wurtz had an engine failure, Ricardo Rosset in the other Minardi also had his brakes fail on him. And I've said this before and I'll say it again, I do not understand why Minardi will not improve the reliability of their brakes. Yet again, another double brake retirement for Minardi in a single race. And again, you should make sure the brakes work perfectly and are not likely to fail because brakes aren't fail safe. Ricardo Zonta's clutch went on him and Montemini's engine failed for him. Giancarlo Fisichella retired due to a hydraulics issue. Now, I'm fairly certain we've had Ferraris retire in the past due to hydraulics issues. That's not an uncommon thing. Minardi have dodgy brakes and seemingly Ferrari have dodgy hydraulics. Shinji Nakano retired due to an electronics failure and Heinz Held Frentzen was the first driver to retire from the race with an engine failure. I never thought I would see a driver's championship like this. Okay, sure, Michael Schumacher's leading it, but only by three points over Moreira in second, and then Frentzen and Takaki are joint third place. That's right, Toru Takaki is tied on points with the Benetton driver of Heinz Harold Frentzen. David Coulthard is in fifth, only one point further back. Then it's Johnny Herbert in sixth, another one point further back. Giancarlo Fisichella is in 7th, a race win away from his teammate. Ferrari are now only 3 points away from Benetton, but Stewart are in 3rd place. We're ahead of McLaren and Williams. This has been a fantastically productive episode because we've guaranteed $23.85 million from Red Bull. Regardless of how much the relationship between Stewart and Red Bull worsens over the course of the next two years, they cannot lower that amount of money, unlike pretty much every sponsor we've ever dealt with previously. What a hugely successful episode this was for Stewart, and I hope you guys enjoyed it. If you did, be sure to leave a like, comment down below, and I'll see you guys in the next episode.